transactions here. Whatever will happen today, you won't get to see. No. You get to see. Yeah. As a person, I'm so much of a person. It's not up today, it's history.
uh, the minister in the business office in charge of ICT, who was supposed to join us today, has postponed his trip due to the inauguration event of. However, he will be here tomorrow afternoon and he will uh, share with participants the experience of one regarding the implementation of the ambitious broadband project and all its components. Perfect. Apologies for any inconvenience that should be took place so far. And for that would happen eventually making sure to do our best to make your stay present in the atmosphere of flexibility and mutual understanding here is at home and I wish you successful work. Thank you for coming, for accepting our invitation. haven't had the benefit of hearing what we've been doing, um, to take the message back to your countries. I have left some um, leaflets that you bring back there. The programme this morning I'm going to talk about transferring knowledge to Africa, which you know, I'm very, very committed to. John, to make the next slide. E5, two things have happened. One is that being the first World Telecom Development Conference in 1994. And secondly, and there were a lot of difficulties for the UK government trying to give you, particularly those from the Commonwealth, any training. You couldn't get it because all the money was in the private sector, no longer in government. But this is an indication of who was actually committed at that time. What we committed to do is a direct result of the first uh, World Telecom Development Conference in Buenos Aires was to actually endeavour to provide as much knowledge to those that needed it as we possibly could. And what we found was when we talked, um, they had substantial training facilities and they were willing to give tr some training. So this was the commitment that we were getting from people like Cable and Wireless, BT, which by this time were fully privatised organisations. What have we done? Um, some of you may have been to some of the major conferences that we put on for the development sector um, in Coventry, 2001, 2003, and the last one was 2008. At the request of the ITU, and this is specifically at the request of the ITU, we've developed a number of master's degrees because what you as countries were asking for was not just low-level training, it was how to be competitive strategic operators. And so we've developed law degrees, engineering degrees and management degrees. We recognise, understand real business and so we've trained 12 associate professors. We've also co-sponsored um, four students to study at Cambridge University and to achieve PhDs. At the last conference that we put on in the UK in 2008, you will see a number of participants there from Africa, uh, including um, Sami al Bashir, the Director of the Development Sector, and at that time the Minister, Minister Morenzi, uh, who will be familiar to a number of you in this area. We've signed a number of agreements. Where are we now? Well, we have the founding member, Kevin Wireless is still active. Cambridge University has been awarded an honorary doctorship, a uh, directorship, sorry, and looking at learning, University of Strathclyde, St. Patrick's College, Ford Management, the GSM Association that reflects the needs of all the GSM operators, myself as a, a delivery agent, and as far as fibre is concerned, CTGS um, is a very knowledgeable organisation in the UK providing worldwide training on fiber optic systems and what we've been uh, and also to um, using the, uh, the Open University as well. We've been transferring knowledge to China, 
through Beijing um, University a person of telecoms. And we have a very close relationship with the USTTI. Many African countries attend USTTIs, and, and I know that Irene did in 2009. Um, as I can tell you, there are still two scholarships available for a course that starts in two weeks that haven't been taken up by Africa. They're specifically for LDCs, so it's not too late if any of you are budding lawyers. We have an MSc in Operational Communications, which takes place at Kigali Institute of Science and Technology, <laughs> Science and, Technology. and we have a Master of Communications Management, which the programmes that we deliver in the UK we do the Master of Four extended weekends and it allows you to, to gather the knowledge face to face with the professors. Uh, alternatively, we come to Kigali and deliver the lectures in Kigali as well. Now, one of the things that I can tell you is that the Ministry of Education in Kigali have kindly donated uh, 14 um, scholarships and 12 of those are still available for at least developed countries with the exception of Rwanda. Um, only least developed countries outside Rwanda can benefit from these scholarships. So again, Optic Workshop, and um, that's Minister Gattari, who you'll meet tomorrow, um, welcoming the Managing Director of CTTS, who brought out here $120,000 worth of equipment to do the hands-on teaching. And as you can see, there were, the KTA was recognised by Her Majesty in 2003. Um, what we actually did as a team was to raise 50 million. Because of the contribution that the ITU had made to Africa, we felt very strongly as UKTA that your Secretary General of the ITU who was the first Secretary General from Africa, should be duly recognised. And in March of this year, Minister Marie Gandhi um, was seen here awarding Hamadoun an uh, honorary doctorate. At all. Zero. All the money that we raise, we put back into scholarships. We all work as volunteers. Thanks very much for listening. Reinhard Skoll has come over from Geneva to be with us this morning. Um, he's got a very pressing appointment in Berlin tomorrow morning, so we're highly honoured that he's here with us this morning to explain to you the main purpose of this workshop this week. give you a higher level overview of the work that the ITU-P, the standardization sector of the ITU, is doing. So I have a few slides prepared. I also have a and then uh, let me know if you what your possible answer might be. I'm asking you to uh, think about what you consider mankind's most impressive Of, of helping anyone except that. 
you could argue that the communications network is actually the most impressive accomplishment or engineering feat of mankind. So the internet would, would be would be part of that. Yeah? But if you imagine that today you can call anyone, anytime, anywhere in the world, this room would be able to do that. That's that's just amazing. Yeah? And uh, so this is this would not be possible without IQ. If IQ is uh, divided into three what we call sectors, there is a radio communication sector that deals with uh, Spectrum management with uh, that's uh, uh, the one that's helping you this uh, portfolio. Uh, we do standards. <laughs>
Okay, so I'll give you uh, a few additional slides where I'll show you what the ICO has been uh, doing within the, uh, the last two years. In the uh, video, the similar for television shows that's called the Emmy Award. And so the Emmy Award is given out to a TV series or TV series, but they also have a technical Emmy Award. And IQ uh, received this uh, award in 2008 for the uh, H264 standard, the according standard, also known by the name of MTEC. That's for that was jointly done with ISO and IC. Anyone with the name of MTEC, that's the ISO name, but the IQ so that's one of the best work that has come out of, uh, of IQP. Uh, here is something that our Secretary General, Dr. Mangan Touré, launched. It's called the Broadband Commission. So the uh, Broadband Commission consists of about 50 well known people that are the chair of the Broadband Commission, together with uh, Carlos Slim. Anyone has heard the name of Carlos Slim? That's the richest man or the richest person in the world right now. <laughs> so both uh, the two of them are chairing the Broadband Commission. Mm -hmm. And then there are a couple of other ministers and uh, a couple of billionaires in the Broadband Commission and the Nobel Prize laureate. And the idea of the Broadband Commission is to develop uh, guidelines, best practices for governments on how to implement broadband Yet I do believe that broadband is going to be something like water or electricity or roads or something which everyone needs to have, wants to have, or just be a commodity. Uh, in September, and uh, so this is a very, a very good initiative that Dr. Uh, uh, started. Here's another field, the uh, officials, they make conference, uh, video conference calls, so they don't have to travel, uh, so that saves energy, that saves time. Uh, so that's a positive aspect. But how do we estimate uh, and compare positive and negative estimates is uh, that there are different methods uh, on the market. So different companies use different methodologies to estimate the impact of ICTs on climate change. So what we and I do want to do is we want to standardize a methodology so that we can really compare apples with apples and oranges with oranges and then be able to use the charge uh, that we have used with the previous phone. So what would be nice is really to have a universal charger that can be used for any phone, any mobile phone, or maybe even uh, for other devices. So the IQ has come out, and that was in April this year, with the universal charger. So I think we've never seen any uh, topic that got so much press in that than uh, when we announced that we have a recommendation standard for a universal charger. The problem is there is a topic accessibility, which has also seen a lot of uh, input in IQ within the last uh, couple of years. So accessibility is in a sense to uh, access information and communication technologies. The person you see here is an Italian gentleman who had an accident a few years back, he cannot move anything. What he can move is, he can move his eyelids, but he cannot move his hands, he cannot move his legs, he cannot be completely paralyzed. But because of uh, advances in ICT, he's able with his eyes, and so that's just one example of how an ICT can help also in disabled people to uh, communicate. But now his, uh, Life is much, much improved. He's able to uh, contact, uh, be in contact with his daughter, to communicate with her, with, uh, with her friends. So that's also a topic accessibility, which is very high on the agenda right now. All right, here's another standard home networking, and that's also done by the uh, networking standard that encompasses phone lines and car lines and coaxial cables. This is a very high profile work, it gets a lot of uh, uh, feedback in the press and because there is, a, there is a huge market behind that. Cyber, gender points of the Secretary General of IQ. Uh, 
series of cover from uh, from the Economist a couple of uh, uh, weeks ago. Uh, okay, the, uh, the, the heading next World War might might have been in cyberspace. So cybersecurity, security. Mm -hmm. June of this uh, year, two new standards activities. One is called Smart Grid. Have you heard the term of Smart Grid? Sure. So the, the, the term grid, that's the term that the electricity people use for their network. They don't call it network, they call it grid. You know, that's what they call it. And uh, the electricity grid is not as smart as our communications network. So the idea is to put intelligence into the electricity network. So that's called smart grid. And so we have started as standards activities on this in, uh, in June. We have another standards activity that we started. That's called cloud computing. Now, cloud computing is a term that's heavily used and used too much. Uh, there's a lot of hype among uh, with the term cloud computing. What it means, uh, if cloud computing basically is very simple means that your data or your applications are not stored locally, they're stored on your Google Gmail account. Your email is stored not locally, it's stored somewhere in the cloud, somewhere in some server, somewhere in the internet. Right? So this is not really nothing new. If you look at the history of computing, things have been going back in our architectures, but uh, currently, and this is also a cover story that uh, was uh, done in October 2009. Now, cloud computing is a topic which is uh, gaining a lot of attention these days. Where we explore how ICTs can help uh, in, in things like traffic management uh, and so on. All right, okay, so this was an IQT overview. Now we zoom into IQP, so IQ15, which is uh, one of the, I think, most exciting uh, study groups that we have in IQP. It's also our biggest study group. Under IQ15, there will be no, no transfer, there will be no access from the ASL or ESL. So we're very happy to have such a, a such group. And this group also put together, well, first of all, they did, uh, they wrote a handbook. Four pros uh, from around the world. So one of them is uh, already here. That's uh, if I put him. So I think if we call him Gerald, I think that's uh, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. And then we have another uh, uh, pro. He is from Brazil. He's currently stranded in Kigali. Found him, yeah. So okay, excellent. Yeah. So he is. Uh, he will be coming uh, today. So there will we'll be uh, each. Uh, Makoto Murakami from Japan, uh, together with a professor, Giancarlo De Marcus. He is from Peru. So those have been heavily involved in the work of study group 15. They know every kid and every pipe and every everything. <laughs> Thank you. 
also because at the end of the course, we'll give you an evaluation form, yeah, which you must, well, you don't have to, but it will be great if you could print this uh, evaluation form for us so that we see, and uh, that will help us in shaping future courses. And uh, then, I myself, I will be leaving after lunch together with. Breaks are thanks to uh, the Kinali government, their, their sponsor. So there's a coffee break that we will discuss this with the uh, Cooper and with Kinali and probably with Matthew as well. We'll see what they give to us. That should be fine. And uh, I think that's probably everything I wanted to uh, share with you. <laughs> So for those who haven't registered, I also do registration. So uh, have you have you paid? That's uh, that's now. Did you did you pay? Uh, did you pay now? So then you contact him and yeah. he's uh, taking care yeah. of you. Do, do you know how high the rides are? I mean, are they going to drop? Yeah, yeah, that's in, a normal in, one, in, yeah. In the yeah. yeah. He's the from uh, Okay, right. So this one seems to be expensive. Right. If, if you compare with that one. So I have not seen it yet. Yeah, I mean, if you, you can send me the detail, we can then okay. talk to CTTS to see which they okay. prefer.
on the recommendation G652, I think it's general single mode fiber, and the new recommendation G657, the tens and sensitive single mode fiber. And as a means document, so you put there usually discussions all the refractor of IQ, and you bring it at the meetings, a draft version which can be discussed at the meetings, and after the, the, the meeting has finished, you bring the last version. Um, in IBC, um, I've done my work mostly in uh, subcommittee 86A, and more particular. And since about five years, I've been the convener of that group, so the chairman of that group. And since uh, last year, I've been elected as the uh, chair of SC subcommittee 86A. Uh, because of my job in both organizations, IEC and ITU, I'm also the liaison, liaison officer between the two organizations because we want to keep our, both our uh, standards and recommendations in the best way harmonized. So if there's some development in ITU, and usually ITU is leading on the single mode fibers, we as well. Maybe it's uh, also a good time now for you to uh, introduce yourself. So my proposal is that we uh, name our, give our name, uh, give our affiliation, where your background is, which country, which company, and maybe you can see, say a few words about your background in optical communication. Sako Abdullah, I come from Guinea Conakry, and I work in the company. The name for the company is a regulator, authority regulator in telecommunication. And uh, my department is uh, the DICE department, IT, IT department. And uh, I am the key for, for all infrastructure and system in my company. Thank you. This is uh, man. I'm from Burundi. Uh, I work uh, at the agency of radiation and control of the communication. My name is Ben. I'm calling from Stuttgart, from Tanzania. I'm working with the Tanzanian Telecommunication Company. Actually, we are in the network planning and development. Thank you. Clear that the fiber cannot accept a large cone. It's fully determined by the refractive index difference between the core and the cladding. And for single mode fibers, that difference is not so big. For multi mode fibers, we usually see that the index difference is of like the uh, sensitivity to the, to the fiber. Also, an important issue is that uh, this, uh, the refractive index parameter is also determining um, the speed of light through this medium. Um, and the very simple formula is that the light speed, where the phase gym, uh, divided by the So this is a, a principle how light guiding these fibers. Okay. Let's move on then to the first section of uh, chapter one, which is dealing with the concept of all fibers uh, of a very simple structure, uh, what we call a set index fiber, which means that the core, so we call these fibers set index multiple fibers. And what we can see from here is launch light into the fiber and we launch a very small uh, probe in time to see that the, the we see already very quickly that the distance within the fiber is also different. Those nodes relative to the center part of the core are much shorter than the distance between those all those sensors. So that means that you see that the, the, the waves which have just at the eccentric angle they have the largest way to go and will leave the fiber uh, at the latest time. So that means the sorry, the, the largest uh, uh, sorry, it is for that reason that this fiber is hardly used anymore in data communication. You see this kind of fiber is still being used for other applications like illuminating fibers or something like that. The industry found a solution for this problem of multi distortion 
by introducing a new fiber uh, called graded index multiple fiber. And in this case, the core engine is now built up out of a uh, graded defective index. It's not a constant defective index. It's constantly changing um, over the radius. And what's happening then is that we don't have any more of those strict core threading boundaries as it had with different modules, different passes, but we can uh, modify the, the structure of the index uh, in such a way that the total uh, total product could be uh, reduced. How do we do that? And that's the only factor is involved. Those modules which are already in the center part of the core will be the highest defective index. That's the way. Um, because the defective index is higher there, the speed of those modules is, is more limited than the modules which are ready at the outer of that a short path and a long path. But the difference in speed of those modules is different and it can compensate for that as well. So that's the reason so we have a carefully designed defective index and we have tried to make it here. Take care of that. We can limit the total rate. That's the total volume. Steppingness, we have a very large total volume, and we can limit that to the graded index side of the So that's the way uh, Fibermen has solved this problem. However, still at this total volume, so these fibers will not give you just multiple fibers as being developed and being used. And graded index multiple fibers are being used massively in data common systems, so in all local area networks, so the short distance connections in data centers uh, where you need a very easy connectivity to resources uh, so the solvents uh, do not play a big role, then you will find multiple fibers. Multiple fibers are important. We had only multiple fibers in the very beginning of the protocol uh, telecommunications, so in the late 70s and the early 80s, then we had uh, multiple starting up of the telecommunications, but nowadays that has completely changed everything to multiple fibers. Much smaller. At a certain time, only one node, one waveform is fitting into the structure. So you don't have multiple nodes on the team anymore. You have only one node, so the whole model dispersion is disappearing. That is the background why single node fibers have been developed. So the big issue with the big improvement from going from multi mode to single node fibers, the reason why these single node fibers became very popular from the beginning of over the earlier uh, multi-mode fiber connections. That's, of course, because the multiple diameter is much smaller, so the connectivity is, is not so easy as compared to multi-mode fibers. But that is doable because you can share those single-mode fibers at high bit rates. You can share it with many, many customers who are all sorts of direct connections from one computer to another computer. Uh, then you have to have very uh, cheap solutions. So that's the reason why Multi-mode fibers are used in datacom, and why single-mode fibers are generally used for datacom applications. Uh, if we allocate to the multi-mode, for example, for connecting buildings, what should be the maximum resource? Yeah, for, for multi-mode. Yeah. Well, for 10 gigabit Ethernet applications, that we see different qualities. Any more questions so far? Then um, in section two of the, and now we switch over to single mode fibers. Uh, what you can see over here is a group of what we call dispersion free shifted single mode fibers. We can have greater or mean with that. And we have also dispersion shifted single mode fibers. Um, dispersion free shifted fibers. Uh, you see here a design which we call a next cladding design, um, which means that the directly adjacent cladding you see over here, uh, adjacent to the core, should have the same defective index level as the outer group fibers of next cladding. In contrary to that, in the early days we also had so called depressed cladding fibers. The cladding to the core was at a different defective index level as the outer. Do not 
Pane, podržte to vše, že na tom můžeme být spolu, na zkusnou pání, protože ty jeho čáry vrátí mít tu pohodu, mít tu dobu, mít to, že jsme se spolu zase spolu. that this was an idea to have a lowering and a reduction of the accumulation error. Nowadays we do not use it. We will use the two best practice. My company also started to remote farms with a two best practice ritual, but nowadays we have completely switched over for standard remote farmers uh, and that's what I use to now. Now this is made by adding another filter called QLI. So we have Jermaine Mozart This is a special group inside the group of dispersion and shifted fiber. The large bulk of fiber is being installed in the group with the group of match threading fiber. Now we will see later that if you manipulate the core design a little bit more <coughs> by increasing the refractive index height and making some structures like here, you can change the correct dispersion. I will come back to that later. And then you can... Uh, uh, we do not prescribe the bow part. start with, uh, fiber makers start with a making of a big in the sense of a broad a glass tree form uh, that's, that's rather, rather short. And worldwide we see uh, four different manufacturing processes. Um, the oldest one is the NCVD process and nowadays there's a lookalike called Furnish CVD. Um, it's an inside tube process and based on thermal energy. I will give you in a moment a picture of such a process. Then we have a second process called OVD, outside paper deposition. And this is, uh, as the name already indicates, an outside process. It does not use any tubes uh, at all. It is also a thermal based process. Um, a Japanese lookalike. In all those three forms, we have a kind of chemical uh, process going on. So I form a gas <laughs> called uh, silicium beta chloride, uh, which is reacting with this oxygen. We create SeO2. That is quartz. That's the basic static uh, wavelength dependent. I have shown here an example from my company, uh, which we uh, indicate some regular D652 fibers and also some bending principle fibers. And you see that the different bar I will indicate to you. We as fiber makers, we are applying a double layer around the glass, uh, and the inner layer is soft and the outer layer is hard. The amount of those parameters, the characteristics of those two layers, are very much important to, to fight against the microwave stuff. So that's what we have done over the years. We have made, uh, developed new coating designs for which can keep it microwave so that you will do it more and more. But this is typical of parameter which is not standardized, can make an optimization of its own coatings uh, by means of the measurement methods which are available. So again, it's a different magic parameter maybe. Uh, it's not so clear as micro bending, but for us as fiber makers, it's a very important parameter in optimizing the coatings around the fiber. Okay. Thank you. 
the time that we had only one general uh, relative voltage marker. So no uh, wavelength division, voltage regression yet, only one general. Certainly, this breakthrough has resulted in an enormous breakthrough in fiber combination of the optical fiber amplifiers. So that this is a real uh, large breakthrough in, in history. At the same time, we saw, and I will show you later, that uh, this effect, the optical amplification and the use of multiple channels, is a very bad combination if you look at the initial fiber screen time. These are not developed for this kind of application. So new fiber for GPU with um, even more channels, uh, even channels, 160 channels, could be realized, uh, 10 gigabit Ethernet, but also 4 gigabit Ethernet became available, and a new uh, version of MWSF was uh, introduced, and that time called Wideband uh, MWSF, the G655. blocks by a similar fiber you are using in web applications, namely the multiple fiber. That was a big key idea behind that project. But we also started working on a density sensitive signal of fiber, and that fiber became graphical, visual uh, interpretation. Um, around uh, 1966, we saw the first uh, prediction by Mr. Gao that fiber optics would certainly be feasible. Um, it lasted up to 1970. I believe, when Corning announced 20 GB kilometers was uh, maintained in, in use. Again, this was a fiber <coughs> working at 850 nanometer, it was a multi-mode fiber. And that indicates over here, so this is the first phase of real commercial installation in supersonic multi-mode fibers. Those combinations here were specimen fibers, which were with several wavelengths uh, shipped with fiber. G654 was uh, born around 86-87 around that time frame. Uh, that was a fiber which was uh, the beginning also mentioned a lost uh, optimized fiber. It was specially proposed by Asian countries. Japan uh, was pushing for this fiber to use it in submarine applications at the lowest cost of 50-50 nanometer. Um, that was the aim of this fiber. Uh, certain tests were not used, so the reason being is that it's the reason why this fiber is bad. Did you all have it? No. no.